Bonjour mes enfants, it's your Uncle Dan the Vinyl Man back with another episode of Uncle Dan's Vintage Vinyl. And today I'm going to be talking about something that touches on uh, one of my earlier videos that is the uh, scandal involving mobile fidelity and the fact that it has a digital step in its, uh, a digital step in its uh, recording process, uh, mastering process. Uh, they apparently take it, have been doing for some years, taking a uh, analog master tapes, digitizing them, and then using that to create cut the first uh, cut the first lacquer, from which then the intermediate uh, uh, disc is made, and then that uh, presses the uh, uh, is used for pressing the uh, discs is sold to the uh, to the consuming public. Not surprisingly. Uh, uh, class action plaintiffs have been bringing suit and I know of two cases in suit right now and when I talk about this please understand that Uncle Dan uh, in, in addition to being a fan of vinyl and uh, uh, an intrepid collector of turntables I'm up to 35 now is also actual licensed practicing attorney and I do have some experience in uh, uh, class actions on both the plaintiff side and the defense side. So I've been on both sides of that V. In any event, yeah, they brought suit uh, uh, in two, two suits that I know of are filed, and I wouldn't be surprised that there are more out there that uh, I don't know about. Uh, the first uh, was filed in uh, the Western District of Washington uh, by the Badgley Mullins Law Firm. And, uh, oops, I keep forgetting the, uh, uh, well, it doesn't matter who the lawyer is. Anyway, the Badgley Mullins Law Firm out of uh, Seattle, I've never uh, litigated against them. Uh, they used to have a you know pretty decent reputation. So, uh, although they're down to a very small firm now, uh, used to be a larger firm. In any event, they filed uh, on August 2, uh, naming as uh, defendants Audio File Music Direct Inc. doing business as Music Direct Mobile Fidelity, Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab, and or MoFi. And they have two plaintiffs, one out of Washington State and one out of Oregon, uh, and filed in the Western District, U.S. District Court for the Western District of Washington. Uh, class actions can be filed uh, almost, uh, you know, in any any jurisdiction. Uh, but there are basically 51. Well, there are more than that, but let's say 51 U.S. jurisdictions. Uh, the 50 states plus uh, uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, you also get districts for the outlying islands, etc., uh, and including Puerto Rico. I'm not sure where Puerto Rico falls. It may have its own district, uh, but in any event, there are uh, there are federal district courts in all those. You've got state state courts in every one, uh, or the district uh, this the district. Uh, excuse me. The well, I'm not sure about Washington D.C. anymore. Uh, but I think it's got its own its own uh, district courts. Then there are also the federal district courts, so you've got two jurisdictions going on there. Most people want to file uh, class action complaints if they can in the U.S. District Court. Uh, there is a mechanism for that. Uh, the Class Action Fairness Act will allow you to do that. The other one is filed in the Northern District of Illinois, which is where uh, uh, Mobile Direct is headquartered. And its plaintiff, uh, Adam Stiles, is out of North Carolina. And they bring it uh, uh, against Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab Inc. Also class action. Uh, so we've got two class actions going. For a class action, you have to identify the class, who are the class members, who are the members of the class. Uh, in total, the Washington, uh, Washington, when they have two classes, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Washington class and a national class, and they have two dates for it, uh, people who purchased from 2015 to the present, or basically people who purchased from July 20, uh, 27, 2016 to the present. July 27, uh, six years six years back on, on a contract claim, and that's, I think, what they're doing. Six years on a contract claim for Washington. Uh, in 
their class, the plaintiffs, all plaintiffs had to have purchased directly from Mobile Fidelity or Music Direct or one of its DBAs. So there had to be direct purchase there. In Styles, by contrast, uh, the Styles, uh, wait, wait, sorry, that's the wrong one. The Styles complaint, uh, they have all purchasers of records as their class. So anybody who purchased a MoFi record could be on there as a member of the class. Uh, and I see some problems there because uh, all of their causes of action, pretty much all of them require the purchasers to, to have an awareness at some level uh, of the uh, unfair and deceptive trade practices. So it may not, I'm not sure that they can get that for people who might have gone into, you know, just a record store. I mean, I, I think you can buy MoFi's even at Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can certainly buy them off Amazon. And, you know, you can see somebody buying one without paying attention to uh, Mobile Fidelity's uh, claims about having an all analog signal. So I have some concerns about that class. But, you know, maybe, maybe it'll work. Uh, for them. Uh, the, the class out of the Washington case, the Tuttle, the Tuttle matter out of Washington State, because they've got a direct, they have a direct uh, purchase there. Easier to say, yeah, everybody in this class would have uh, been exposed to the, uh, to the statements on the website where they say that the uh, that the products are have, uh, are produced from an all analog uh, chain. So I think those are. I, I think there is an issue with the styles. Uh, but you know, look, I'm not offering legal advice. I'm not offering a le legal opinions. Uh, I am a lawyer, but not offering legal advice. Not offering legal opinions. Uh, these are just some reflections I have. Uh, and uh, God knows, there's got to be some work here. Uh, before it gets sorted out. The Washington case, when you have a, a complaint like this, you'll have factual allegations and then you have causes of action. And a cause of action is basically, you think of it as a legal theory for, uh, for it. It's like, so you have to say, what's the law? Well, the law is the law of contract. And your theory is, say, a breach of contract. And you say these facts constitute a breach of contract. For breach of contract, for example, you the allegations are that there was uh, there was a contract which involves you know you know offering consideration, offer acceptance consideration. Uh, there was a contract; it was breached, and that breach caused damages. Uh, so that's that's one of the uh, you know that's that notion of breach of contract is is the claim. The Washington case has four uh, causes of action. The first is the Washington Consumer Protection Act. And the cons uh, every state and jurisdiction, uh, well, 51 of them, uh, from Washington to, to the District of uh, you know, Washington State to the District of Columbia, each has a Consumer Protection Act, and those basically prohibit unfair and deceptive trade practices. Uh, so they've got the Washington version in here. That's the first cause of action. That's good for any any purchaser out of Washington. It would not apply to any purchaser elsewhere. Next, they have a breach of contract claim. I think that should have been pled as a breach of warranty claim. These are uh, the uh, Uniform Commercial Code, uh, Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code will apply to that because it's a uh, sale of goods that are movable at the time of identification of the contract. So, so the uh, UCC would apply and we'd usually talk about, uh, talk about those in terms of uh, uh, breach of warranty rather than breach of uh, contract. But, okay, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the next claim is a claim for unjust enrichment, which basically says they got something from us. They got money from us that they shouldn't have gotten, and it was unjust. It was somehow in inequitable. Uh, typically, you have that if you don't have a, if you don't have a contract claim. Uh, so, you know, you have that. They're, they can be a little bit, the those are a little janky, actually. Courts kind of don't like unjust enrichment claims. If you've got a contract, you don't need your unjust enrichment claim. 
And I think I'd be better off, better, happier with the complaint with that. I'm going to pause and come back. Back. Okay, so the fourth claim is the Illinois Consumer Fraud Act, which is much like the Washington Consumer Protection Act. Uh, and the Illinois Consumer Fraud Act is uh, alleged because MoFi is headquartered in Illinois. That's why the other case, the the style, uh, the Styles Clay case, is uh, uh, venued there. Uh, why they chose that uh, venue for the for the action. I like the Illinois Consumer Fraud Act uh, allegation because uh, a state will usually have uh, an interest in ensuring that its uh, uh, its residents, including including its corporate residents, uh, abide by their laws. So it makes sense that anybody in the United States could come to Illinois, in essence, and say, hey, Illinois, this, this uh, uh, corporate resident of yours was committing these unfair and deceptive trade practices. So I, I tend to like that one. I think that one is, uh, is going to work. Uh, the, now the act does say that there, that defines a deceptive act or practice as representing that goods or services are of a particular standard, quality, or grade, or that goods are a particular style or model if uh, they uh, are of another. I think you can fit this in under there. Uh, I think that Mobile Fidelity is going to argue that the, that, uh, the quality of the product uh, is good. You know, they will pass without objection in the trade. Uh, it doesn't matter that they have a they have a, a, a digital step because the digital step is transparent, which I think it is. Uh, the the and, and I don't care what you know uh, the one guy I can't remember his name, but you know people who say that they can hear the digital step they can't. Uh, not on not on these. You cannot. You're not hearing a digital step in these. Uh, because the, the digital uh, the digital capture they're doing is at a degree of resolution that is beyond uh, the human ear's ability to, to identify. So these are sonically transparent. Uh, and if anything, they might uh, result in an even better uh, an even better uh, 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 excuse me better product at the end of the day. And, and it may be that MoFi will, will argue that, although I think that that's going to be a, a, a challenging one. And I think it's going to be challenging because, you know, they changed their, uh, you know, they've changed their, uh, or their brand, or excuse me, they've changed their statements on the web. They've started putting hype stickers uh, uh, on explaining where they have uh, a digital step in the mastering process. Uh, and it's going to look like they had a deceptive uh, uh, practice. And I think you can get enough people uh, enough audio files to come forward and say, "Look, uh, there are people who believe that this is that this makes a difference, and who want an all analog uh, chain, uh, and so they and they've been selling them as that and earning more money that way because they charge more. People are willing to pay more for these all analog recordings. I think that's a very powerful argument. I don't know whether it will fly or not, but it's it seems strikes me as a very powerful argument." Uh, Styles, the Styles uh, uh, case uh, in that action, they have uh, uh, seven uh, causes of action asserted. The first is an express warranty, uh, and that is that they expressly warranted that they had all analog recording chain. Uh, I think there's a, a decent argument there. Uh, they have uh, a claim for breach of implied warranty, and I think that's harder because uh, that means that you really you have to show that the goods would not have uh, passed without objection in the trade. And that's, I just don't think, going to fly. And when I read the complaint, it really sounds like they're, it's, they're just restating their express warranty claim. They have a cause of action, third cause of action is for a uh, breach of the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. Uh, I, I've done a number of cases, uh, been on the defense side of a number of cases where the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act is uh, pled, and if you don't have basically if you don't have a, uh, a state law uh, warranty claim, you're not going to get a, a Fed a Magnuson Moss warranty claim. So th they're going to have to get get that one. Uh, the next allegation they have is a fraud allegation, uh, and I think they've got pr 
problems with that, and I think they know they have problems. For a fraud, uh, to sustain a, an allegation or sustain a cause of action for fraud, you have to show a, a knowing false uh, misrepresentation of material fact uh, uh, that uh, with reasonable reliance uh, uh, by the plaintiff and damages flowing from that reliance. So for that, you have to show that, uh, I, I think they can show that it was a knowing uh, false statement of fact, material fact, uh, but I'm not sure for the class, every class member, they can show that it was, uh, that there was reliance uh, by the class uh, members on that, because I think a lot of people might have purchased MoFi's, MoFi records without knowing that uh, they were supposed to be all analog. So I think that's a problem with the fraud claim. I think they try to get around it by claiming that MoFi had what's called a fiduciary duty, which uh, is a higher duty uh, toward the purchasers. I don't think that's going to fly because I don't, I don't see that they're standing in a fiduciary relationship. That usually requires some special relationship, a parent to a child, a lawyer to a client, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bankers sometimes, people in that, uh, in, uh, that uh, situation, guardians. Those are fiduciaries, so they don't have that here, and I don't. I don't think they're going to have it. Uh, I think they're not going to win on that one, but you know it's out there. Uh, the Styles case also asserts an unjust enrichment claim. Uh, again, you know, same thing I said before. It has a, a North Carolina unfair and deceptive trade practices act claim uh, because Styles is out of North Carolina and the the uh, state. Unfair and deceptive trade uh, practices claims are all pretty much alike. So, uh, the, uh, I mean, there are differences among them, but I think that this one is, uh, you know, a reasonable one. And then for their seventh cause of action, they identify, and I, and I think this is a good, uh, a, a good approach, they identify each state's uh, uh, statute uh, that uh, uh, the Deceptive Trade Practices Act statute because each state has a version of that. And I think that's a good uh, approach for a national class. Uh, so I think the, uh, I think both of the complaints have legs. Uh, I think there are some issues uh, with the Styles complaint because I think they may have drawn the class too broadly, but they can narrow the class. But then there's the issue, we have two competing class actions and I bet there are more that have been filed, maybe not. Uh, I would think that a California attorney would have filed a class action, maybe in California state court. Uh, but uh, California's unfair competition law, their version of the uh, of the Deceptive Trade Pat Practices, Unfair Deceptive Trade Practices Act, uh, I've litigated that, and that is uh, that law has really sharp and biting teeth. It will get you. So I think that there's probably a California class out there. I expect that if there if there are any state law uh, actions, any, any, any brought in state court, that those will be removed by mobile fidelity to federal court. And they'll probably have them uh, consolidated uh, because, you know, if you've got, you know, you're going to have overlapping class members and you could have uh, uh, contradictory relief in the two uh, class actions that we have, or we could have contradictory results. It might be that you know the Northern District of Illinois uh, court would reach a different decision on the merits uh, than the Western District of Washington. So, but but the class members overlap. So you might say, wait a minute, I lost as a plaintiff in in uh, the Northern District of Illinois, for example, but I won in the Western District. That's confusing. So there so there'll be a consolidation of these, and they'll work that out through probably the multi-district litigation process. Uh, also, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if uh, Mobile Fidelity were to uh, file bankruptcy. And if bankruptcy uh, is, uh, uh, if, if uh, they file bankruptcy, then all of, the, uh, all of this will get addressed in one way or another by the bankruptcy court. The bankruptcy court would, would say, okay, we're gonna sort these, uh, sort these two actions out. And once that's figure, figured out, we'll, we'll sort, them, sort them all out and figure out what what part of the pie uh, these uh, uh, plaintiffs might get. I expect payout, not sure, can't, can't predict anything, uh, can't guarantee anything, 
but uh, it's very interesting. Uh, for a lawyer, I look forward to watching it. So there you go. And by the way, I call this, I'm going to call this uh, Revenge the Suckers. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, this is not legal advice. Uh, it is not a legal opinion. My opinions are just opinions based on the complaints as I've seen them and based on uh, some, uh, some of the uh, uh, YouTube materials out there and some of the, some of the, uh, uh, some of the other stuff. But really based on my reading of, reading of these, I express no opinion as to the merits of the complaints. You know, I think maybe they're good, but you know, don't, you know, don't quote me on it, kids. Uncle Dan the Vinyl Man saying, Au revoir, et aussi, mes enfants, à bientôt!